Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here in the, what do you call it, the 130 block, I guess you'd call it. <laughs> Life after statehood here on Think Tech uh, with Ray Tsuchiyama, an informed citizen with whom I have wonderful discussions and so enjoy it. And we, uh, our discussion today is about education in Hawaii. We, we talk about it from the vantage of life after statehood, but we really go further than that. And uh, just, to, just to sort of set the stage, Ray and I uh, met uh, serendipitously uh, downstairs and we started talking about the brotherhood of graduates out <laughs> of the high schools and how everybody knows each other. And those relationships, assuming people stay here, are like lifelong. And they mean a lot because they represent a trust relationship between the co-graduates. Usually it's somehow bonded with nostalgia, uh, but the reality is if I went to the same school that you did, for Farrington, for example, I know you for my whole life and I trust you. The, lot, the, lot, the larger possibility is that I will trust you for my life. And this affects the way I do business, the way I do politics, uh, the way I live in the community, my friends, so to speak, for life. And you've had that experience, haven't you? That's entirely correct. And um, it's a double-edged sword, though. I mean, it's the warm, fuzzy, uh, societal, cultural bond that uh, one has with his or her high school uh, in, in Hawaii. I also left on the mainland, uh, uh, lived uh, many years in Massachusetts, Washington State. Had no networks there, when you think about it. I, I was just uh, an alien in the, in the communities, and uh, many people from Hawaii are, unless they start uh, uh, meeting other people mm -hmm. who are from Hawaii, like in Clark County, Nevada, where there's 70,000 <laughs> former Hawaii uh, residents, or in Seattle, yeah. Portland, Los Angeles, uh, DC, um, even in Chicago. There are now clusters of former Hawaii residents. And as you know, um, since the mid-late 90s, many public high school reunions uh, are held in Vegas. And that was a catalyst also for the discovery of Vegas for a place to emigrate, uh, actually, for another job. Sure, and because there's a community waiting for you there. Well, so yes, that's right. You have a waiting. And, and, and uh, the business uh, structure, the economy of uh, Vegas, is uh, nearly uh, analogous to Hawaii in hospitality, hotel, uh, selling cars, insurance, uh, restaurants. If you have a union card, well, you know, Teamsters, ILDB, you can get a job tomorrow in, yeah, in yeah, Vegas. Yeah, Very yeah. easy. Yeah. And if you have, of course, if you know a Farrington, McKinley, or Kalani, or Kaimuki uh, friend, a classmate there, that it makes it even easier to get into that community. And even now there are uh, Hula Halau and also the Hawaiian Chamber of Commerce and many connections in a, <laughs> in a city that nobody really thought about in the 50s and 60s. Yes. Uh, it was like way out in the mainland. No, no, why leave Hawaii? This is, uh, this is Hawaii's the greatest place on earth. Yeah. So right now, if I snapshot it, and we can ramp up to this from oh, as far back as you <laughs> want to go, we have, um, we have a DOE, the Department of Education, that uh, goes to all islands. It's That's a right. centralized system. Right. It's very unusual right. because on the mainland, usually it's a county Towns, by county yeah, or, or school even district. Small towns, right, district. right, right, yeah. Uh, and it's funded that way. In right. this case, it's funded taxes, by the right. state right. Uh, out of, out of uh, our income tax. Um, we have uh, one large university, huge right. one and a half billion dollar university uh, with 10 campuses, but it, it's, it controls higher education right. for sure. We have most people who want to go to you know, college, just by numbers, go to college at UH. That's what they do. Uh, and law school and medical school and so forth. So we're, we're we sort of um, independent. We sort of, uh, you know, have a, a contained system of education. And then, of course, you got the private schools, which are more powerful here than they are in most other states. Right. And you have the process of the brain drain, where the best graduates, are, or, or a lot of graduates, tons of graduates, perforce, they leave town. They get educated to leave town. <clears throat> this is unusual. This is not like it is elsewhere, the, all these combinations of things. So my question to you, this is not easy, and if you want to think about it, you can, <laughs> is how do we get here? How do we arrive at this place? That's, that's a, a very easy question to answer, actually. Um, and the roots of one central school district is not a state of Hawaii invention. It goes back to King Kamehameha III. All right. Right? And, and when the kingdom declared a school district, it was one of the m uh, major revolutions for a monarchy or a nation to declare w education will be f uh, public and to treat every citizen the same fr from each island, from Kauai to 
the island of Hawaii. Now, but you could understand why King Kamehameha III was so focused on this, because even until the 1820s, Kauai was a separate kingdom. And it was, uh, Kamehameha I were, was, uh, after conquering Oahu, had to go back to the island of Hawaii to suppress a rebellion. <laughs> so e even into uh, Leo, uh, King Kamehameha II and III, they were afraid of each island going in its own way. So why not consolidate education and to have it uh, really uh, 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 a, a, a offering for all residents and at the same level. There was at, the value in that. Uh, at the same level, at the same high, uh, high level, so that a resident of Lihui would receive the same education as a person in downtown Honolulu as in uh, Kahului, as in, uh, in Hilo. Yeah. So, so that, that is uh, the ideal here. Now, when you go into, uh, and, and it started out in Olala Hawaii, uh, uh, teaching in Hawaiian, the language. And I, they I want to give you a footnote. Yes. Yeah. So at the Mission House, the Mission House Museum conducts uh, plays, plays uh, uh, representing real people who died right, right. and who were buried in Oahu Cemetery. Right. And you go to Oahu Cemetery, and you go around and you talk to some of the deceased oh, there. Right, right, right. And they're actors, and they, they sit by their right. graves. And when you right. get to their station, <laughs> right. they stand up oh, and they tell right. you who they are and what they've done. Well, I went last right, Friday, right. and there was a fellow named Andrews. He was a, he was a, a reverend, a minister, right. trained in Massachusetts, as right. many of them were in those days, came out here with the specific right. idea of teaching children. Right. And he describes in his recitation, which is really we very well done, um, you know, what, what he found and what it was like in teaching children. A, it was very important to the elite right. to teach children. They realized early on, even as early as the 1820s and 30s, right. that they really had to educate uh, the keiki of Hawaii. And, uh, and that meant they had to educate them in English because they did not speak English then. And they had to educate them in the, in the, in the written word, and right. they used the Bible for that. Right. And they translated the Bible from various classical right. languages, even Hebrew, <laughs> right. right, into Hawaiian and into English. Um, it was very interesting, very challenging to be a teacher in right. those days. And, and if you had a calling for that, it was very gratifying. Right. And so what, what I get out of that is that education was seen as a really critical component of bringing Hawaii into the 19th century, which was the effort of the UVE all the way up to the overthrow. And it was working. And, you know, there was more literacy in Hawaii by the, by the time of the overthrow than most places right. in the world. And people really cared about education. And it was an open society in that way. And a society in which uh, they had made incredible progress in only a few decades. And, and I want to point out, uh, Lahaina Luna School uh, was uh, opened as a that. missionary school, actually. They, but the missionaries taught in Olala Hawaii, Hawaii. That was how important Hawaiian was. And then David Malo was an early graduate 18, in the 1830s, and, and he was in his mid-30s uh, by then. And other you know, upstanding Ali children, also uh, sons, began to go to the school. And they, uh, and, and they would go out into other islands and start publishing newspapers and, and books and so Very forth. Very important in, 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 in Hawaii. And books, yeah. In Hawaii. Now, what happens though, it was interesting to see the evolution, is by the 1850s and 60s, it, the language changes to English. Because now that's the uh, language of commerce. Uh, and, and, and the Ali and the king uh, uh, realized that in order to really uh, do business and to do banking, and, and there were the children and missionaries already embarking yeah. into finance. And that's about the time when the royalty started traveling. They traveled that's everywhere right. in the world. In 1848, it comes a great Mahele. Yeah. And then, uh, 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 but you, got a, uh, you have an important point there. Uh, Lahaina School was the first school uh, west of the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> 1831. And, and so the, it was not a kingdom uh, in, in the Pacific. They called it a kingdom of education. That's how priority took for, for education. Then, then you go to the overthrow, uh, and then from the overthrow into the territory, everything starts to change. Remember in the 19th century, like you say, the curriculum for Lahaina Luna, many of these uh, schools were of the highest caliber, the most innovative New England style secular education. Uh, Latin, English, uh, mathematics, uh, navigation, geography. Those were great subjects uh, that were uh, transforming New England uh, just before the great Industrial Revolution, right? They were going to be real managers of, of, of things. Yeah, it wasn't only a transformation. We, we had a transformation here in that period 
but it was a transformation that was moving faster than like transformations elsewhere oh, in the world. Oh, that's right, that's right. We were really I, I mean, there were more literate people in Hawaii than in Korea or Japan or China, in percentage-wise. Yeah. You're absolutely right. It's very strange to think about. There was no public education system in those places. No. It was still a, a very strict uh, uh, you know, kingdom there. But what I'm saying is from the overthrow into the territory, Lahaina Luna School changes into a vocational school. You see, uh, uh, mm, suddenly, the, uh, suddenly there's a change there that the uh, new uh, Republic of Hawaii in the territory did not see children as a high priority really to educate them into leaders. They wanted more people to enter trades and trade trans, schools. Uh, trade schools. So that, that's oh, uh, even Kamehameha. Right, that's right. Trade exactly. Uh, for many years, uh, even police and fire people and so forth. And, and, um, and so that, that was a other. Uh, um, you know, uh, lowering of standards in the early 20th century. However, by the, the uh, 19, 1913 was Maui High School uh, uh, was established, McKinley High Schools and so forth. Uh, large public high schools began to emerge uh, uh, during the uh, territory. And what drove these schools were, was the teachings of John Dewey and how to transform immigrants into real Americans. That's the same Dewey Decimal System. That's person. right, that's right. And so those uh, people, young teachers, uh, who followed the Dewey Principle and, and uh, uh, the acculturation uh, and, and dealing with immigrants, and, and Columbia and others were dealing with the same issues in New York City, remember, uh, and the great books began to, the curriculum uh, out of that period. And so you had a, a huge revolution in the 20s and 30s that taught, taught Latin, math, farms, uh, daily newspapers in, in McKinley and, and uh, uh, Maui High School, and the rise of, uh, of a parallel uh, uh, education system called private schools. The put on holes and your audience began to Why grow. did those private schools emerge? I mean, what we have now is a, a, a high percentage of private schools relative to other places. Um, what, what was there a need for them? Or, of was course. it based on religious organizations? No, what was it? I, I think it was very uh, uh, easy to understand. If you're a missionary family in the na late 19th century or early 20th, you didn't want your children to be with immigrant children. Ah. Very, <laughs> ah. very simple reason. Ah, yeah. <laughs> so there was a parallel, uh, uh, you know, uh, a private school system that uh, was evolving at that time, and it wasn't religious per se. Uh, it was just uh, a, a focus that you uh, wanted a cultural, you know, kind of base uh, for your uh, for your own family, children, uh, and so forth. And, and remember, there were uh, thousands of uh, children being born in the early 20th century among Chinese. Jap I mean, my, uh, uh, Japanese families had four, five, six children <laughs> in those days, all entering school. It was a vast transformation, and uh, they were all uh, their parents could not speak English. And this was a great opportunity. And at Maui High School, for example, where my father went, class of 37, 99.9% of teachers came from the mainland. They As a result, I mean, they, they were well educated, the teachers. Uh, and they, they, yeah. they, Maui High School was a beacon of education. That's it was right. A very good school. And you can understand uh, that, uh, and, I, uh, and you can see what they were preparing the students for statehood. The war and statehood was were coming very close, and in a in a and getting in, off the plantation. Yeah, getting off the, an yeah, emancipation. That's right. Of and, and about they uh, learned about Athenian uh, city-state politics. They learned about Shakespeare. They're studying math and, and 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 Latin. During the war, my uncle knew enough math to do uh, artillery, for example. Right. But remember, you had to understand math. He knew English to communicate orders and read orders. By studying Latin, and they studied Julius Caesar at Maui High School, he could figure out the signs in Rome and understand some of the Italian. You can see how this was uh, progressing. Well, it was a classy progressive. school. It was really a valuable yeah, school. And, and Patsy Mink uh, would graduate in the mid-40s. And uh, remember, Inoue, uh, Senator Inoue went to, for his law degree. He went to George Washington. Governor Arishi went to Michigan. Uh, Patsy Mink went to Chicago for her, her law degree. You can see that they were very bright, achievement-oriented people in the post-war period. But, I mean, uh, here's a gap, maybe I'm jumping too many years, but from there till now, we have a DOE that everybody criticizes. We have a DOE that can't seem to get the metrics right. Uh, we have kids coming out of school, arguably, who shouldn't be graduating. Um, 
we have a problem, don't we? Uh, how did we get from the excellence of Maui High School in the 30s to the problem we have today? Well, I think the focus changed in the post-war period. That once you achieve statehood, everything they thought that economy and so forth would absorb these people. But the economy really didn't change that much for, in, into the 1670s. It was still agriculture. And then the new tourist-based industry took over. I think after the, the black and white character of Hawaii days into technicolor statehood. Yeah, right. exactly. It's a, way it's a great way to look at it. Everything right. after 59, August 59, they thought that it would be a bridge between Asia and, and the mainland. They thought that all in these... Hawaii. Yes, in Hawaii general. in yeah. general would uh, uh, have uh, jobs in finance, in, in science-based research. In Switzerland and the Pacific. Yeah, <laughs> as uh, <laughs> Mr. Smyser used to say, Geneva of the Pacific. Okay. Uh, and, and many, many things uh, uh, they thought would develop in Hawaii. There was actually the economy uh, went the other way because of Vietnam, because of many things that outside of uh, Hawaii's uh, orbit. Uh, and then uh, remember, uh, you have one school district, like you said, very unusual. And you have a, 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 um, a curriculum that does, I think, very well in the middle core of students. But it has challenges dealing with the top people, the top 10%, uh, uh, and the bottom 10%. That's very, very challenging. And the medium is pretty good. I mean, uh, three out of four high school students in Hawaii who enter high school graduate. It's a pretty good score. Mm -hmm. uh, and you ha but Remember, it's a challenge to deal with a district that has 190,000 students. There's 12,000 teachers. And, and, but uh, you put into that, there are military dependents and about 15% uh, who have limited English proficiency. So it's a very complicated system. And you have uh, uh, schools in, uh, in, in uh, rural parts of uh, Hawaii Island and Kauai and Molokai, Kaunakakai, that has issues quite different than McKinley or Farrington or, or Kalani. It's a diversity <laughs> in the state, isn't it? It is unbelievably diversified. And so uh, in a normal structure on the mainland, Molokai or Kailua or Lehui would be its own school system, the district. Would that be better? I think if it all comes down to if the people who are running, administrators running, they should know the best, right? I mean, they're the neighborhood. People who run Waianae should know Waianae very well. I don't know about Waianae or the problems of Honoka'a or uh, Lanai you know, City. They're, they're very neighborhood, very small oriented. So you have to be, have people who know about that geographic area. They have to know about the families, the economy, right? What kind of jobs that they're, they're going to go into. Right afterwards, it would be better. Yeah, right. It's like, you know, it's like those we talked about this before. The little booths in Tokyo, uh, the kiosks, the, uh, kiosks for the police. In yes, Tokyo, yeah. where, the, where the, the fellow in the kiosk, the policeman, knows everybody on the block. So you have a community on the block, and it works really well that way. And it would work well, maybe better, if we had districts where the people running the district knew everybody in the district. Yeah. So, so that that is. Uh, but the key is, would they have the ability to use money? and resources to apply to the issues of their, because right now economies of scale so that DOE can buy huge amounts of food or you know, resources and have you know, cheaper discounts and so forth. Uh, so so th that is the key in all this, whether you have a new structure that allows for devolution you know, into neighborhoods and so forth, other than a very centralized, mm -hmm. very centralized uh, 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 system. Yeah, I, I like to uh, cover, you know, how the statehood changed this and how it has changed since statehood uh, and where it is now, you know, going forward because people are more aware of education uh, and the, the flaws in the system. Uh, so when we come back from this break, Ray, we're going we're gonna to take okay. a, a look at the post-statehood period and the trajectory going forward. That's Ray Tsuchiyama, informed citizen. You're here on Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, life after statehood, and we're talking about education in Hawaii. So ambitious. We'll be right back. Thank 
you. Kindness. Pass it on. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch. Hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff. MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never drive. Okay, we're back. We're live with Ray Tsuchiyama, informed citizen, talking about education in Hawaii here on Life After Statehood. So I give you the moment of statehood. People were coming off the plantations. The schools had been very good, but maybe the, the state was changing in right. a certain way so that the schools, you know, did not maintain that level of excellence, perhaps, the public schools. And by the time we get here to, you know, uh, 2017, there's lots of controversy about it. And maybe one of the reasons is that the, the DOE sits in the lap of the legislature. And if there's one place you don't want to be, it's in the lap of the legislature because you get micromanaged uh, just the way the university has had autonomy problems. And maybe that creates a sort of a, a bureaucracy, if you will. Maybe I'm using that word with a small b mm -hmm. when I should be using a capital B. Um, but here we are, and we have to figure out how to make it work better. We have to develop that excellence. And at the same time, we have to keep our graduates home somehow. What do you think? I mean, can you, do, can you explain the, 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 the evolution of it till now? And then we can talk about where it's going. Well, education, state DOE, or public education was not really an issue when I was a kid, interestingly enough. It was never raised and so forth. It, it, everything was, uh, was uh, rolling along. And then, uh, as you may recall, it was not until the early 90s that suddenly a magazine in town called Honolulu Magazine began ranking the schools. Mm. Uh, suddenly that put a huge spotlight on uh, the public education system. Uh, people, parents in particular, began to rush in and see where are their uh, children's uh, schools rank. And, but there's another group that really was not involved uh, called business. <laughs> uh, business was never really part of the equation. Oh, somebody else's yeah. problem. Yeah. But as you recall, uh, when you go back in time, one of the major uh, uh, leaders was uh, Lex Brody. Remember him? Sure. A small business uh, Thank person. Thank you very much. Yeah, right. He, but he was born and raised in Kauai. He was surfing in his uh, in his eighties, but he had a great small business culture. I even go to Lex Brody's today because I know he's an honest uh, kind of culture he in, in, celebrated a, in, in a business. Business. Right. He celebrated the whole idea of right. small business. But, but he said he's a product of public schools, and, in the, and he came out of Kauai, and uh, he wanted to get into that. And remember, uh, Don Horner of First Hawaiian sure. was also very sure. active. Still active. Again, active. yeah, uh, yeah. Bank, leading bank, and so forth. So it was the spotlight from the 90s into the 2000s, and uh, suddenly uh, the uh, school superintendent Became, became a lightning rod. You know, we have to you know, choose the right one. We, if we don't choose the right one, everything will close. Suddenly, nobody knows who that person was in the 60s or 70s. Uh, uh, the school system was just uh, uh, was, uh, moving along. But the other thing about, the, about society itself, the teacher was also, I think, neglected as a person who really adds value in society. And I'll give you a very simple uh, you know, question. Uh, how many statues of teachers do we have <laughs> around Honolulu? Do we have a, uh, a holiday devoted to teachers? In uh, Brazil, in Sao Paulo, there was a road and, and there was a name. I said, who is this? He's an engineer. He was a famous engineer in Brazil who was, who was named after. But the, I, Elevated to fame that's, and, and uh, that's celebrity. Right. Uh, there is no you know, teacher day in Hawaii, just like there's no day devoted to science, uh, interestingly enough, or scientists. Uh, that we need, uh, and there's no really public recognition of the teachers providing value. And so, uh, but again, there was a disconnect between business and education because business in tourism and hospitality was not, a, it was not based on research, yeah. it was not based on product yeah. development. It, it, it absorbed a lot of people uh, into uh, hotel and hospitality jobs, and the people who uh, graduated from engineering or science left on the mainland, and that was a safety valve for people uh, who left. 
So I think uh, unless business really starts to uh, uh, commit also to visioning a future and say, this is the future of Hawaii. In order to get, get to that future, we must have this type of curriculum and this kind of teaching. It's, it's a very enormous project. Because like I said before, why was it Latin and math and geography and English? You could see that there was a great preparation for statehood and the transformation. It takes of, you somewhere. Yeah, it's that, not just learning for its own sake. Yeah. It, it makes excellence among that generation and for the state. Right. But even among leaders in tourism hospitality, uh, there's a disconnect. Because if I went to them today and said, hey, I'm Ray, uh, I bet that in the future, uh, e-commerce or databases or uh, automatic, uh, you know, um, check-in or robotics and hospital that won't be of any, uh, you know, use to you. They all look at me and say, no, those are things of the future. That's all kind of coming. We are all into e-commerce. We all have to, you know, take care of, uh, you know, how to uh, deal with drones, with, with automation and so forth. But they're not thinking what curriculum in the schools would lead to people who can introduce those technologies You'd love to, to be tourism. a teacher, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, I mean, really, yeah. I mean, there's, there's such an exuberance in saying, we're going to make a whole person out of you. Right. We're going to expose you to the world and prepare you for the world. We're going to, you know, you're going to win with <coughs> what we give you. But let me, let me throw one other yeah. thing that we need to discuss, okay? The unions. Because sometime after statehood, the unions got really strong in education in the schools. And they're also strong in the university, I might add. And, they, and right now, I would say, uh, at least for the DOE, they own the DOE. They, what they want, they get. Uh, although the, they, they lost a case, I think, yesterday in the Supreme Court about some kind of benefits uh, for their teachers. Um, but um, I'm thinking that the unions have not really been helpful in reaching excellence. They represent their members. They want to do the best they can for their teachers and other management people, even principals uh, in the school system, but they don't necessarily um, advance the notion of education and educating children and making the state great with education. And I, and I suggest to you, and like your opinion, uh, that that has had a profound and deleterious effect uh, on our schools. I think uh, the difference between Territory Hawaii and the, and the state system today is that there, we are sustaining a system rather than creating a system. <laughs> uh, there, there has been a system that uh, evolved in the state already in the, in the 60s. I, I was a child. I went to Fern Elementary, Kalakau Intermediate, and Brandon High School. It, but that system continued onwards the same when you think about it from the 60s and onwards. There was not, uh, we really didn't look at the future and say, what are the things that we could do to uh, not only be nationally ranked, you know, what, are, what are the best practices out there, and see how uh, we can even be better. Right. <laughs> not excellent, but uh, in, in, class. Yeah, right, in, the, in, the, in all 50 states of the Union, uh, but beyond that, and really uh, go ahead. So, but I think that took, that takes, very strong state leadership. Ah, <laughs> okay. I, I think, I think uh, uh, there has to be a priority. Like I say, there has to be a, uh, a synergy of business also. That, that, that's the, like I said before, I, I mentioned, I, I, I mentioned, I mentioned that several times, but uh, you cannot complain about the quality of your workers unless you're really involved in the curricula, what, what you really need. In in, uh, in in your workplace and, and the new Ray, technologies. We're out of time. Oh. I wish we weren't. <laughs> I, you know, I want more. We, we haven't finished, but we have. Uh, thank you very much for coming down and discussing. Uh, Ray Tsuchiyama, informed citizen here on education in Hawaii, uh, on life after statehood. There is much more to come. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you. Hello.